Let's take our Bibles and turn to the 23rd Psalm, Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Okay. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And ever. Amen. Well, we have to mention that today is Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem and the people, the enthusiastic crowds, laid their coats and palm branches on the path before him. It was also the day when the Passover lambs were herded up from the pastures around Bethlehem, about five miles to the south, and brought up uh, to locations close to the city. We have been in uh, this section of John, the Gospel of John, that concerns Jesus' teaching on the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, because our Bibles are broken up into chapters, we might not have noticed that this uh, passage really started in chapter 7. So it starts about halfway through chapter 7, and it goes halfway through chapter 10. It is all one teaching. One of the things we're going to see is John structures the Gospels around several teachings of Jesus referred to as the I Am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep we get to today. And I am the good shepherd. The last, uh, in chapter 8, he finishes chapter 8 saying, before Abraham was, I am, invoking the very name of God and applying it to himself. But in the previous chapter, uh, which bears directly upon the subject matter today, Jesus healed a man born blind. And a person born blind is born without uh, the apparatus needed to see, whether it be the, uh, uh, that uh, camera structure of the eyeball itself or the, uh, the retina of the eye, the uh, rods and cones that are light sensors, uh, if it was the nerves, in there, or that little thing back in there, uh, that uh, intermediate processor called the optic chiasma, or the occipital lobe of the brain, where all visual processing takes place. Whatever it was, something was missing in this guy's makeup, in his physical makeup. And Jesus, just as the creator using uh, the dust of the earth, restored the parts of that man's body that were missing. At first, he said, 
to the scribes and Pharisees who were interrogating him, but he didn't know who it was that cured him. Jesus went and found him and explained who it was. Do you believe in the Son of Man, the King? He said, well, I don't even know who he is that I should believe in. He says, he's standing in front of you. But for his trouble, the guy who was healed was excommunicated, cast out of the synagogue, which means he was cast out of the uh, entirety of the religious life of Israel. He couldn't participate in any of it. But Jesus not only was able to correct his, his uh, lack of vision, but Jesus was, all, 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 Jesus was also able to give him a way into a spiritual life that was greater than that of Israel at the time. Jesus says, I am the door. Now, we'll see that this has a double meaning. Back in the last chapter, John uh, chapter 9, verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world. The result of this judgment is that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Those who think they see, those who are quite certain that they've got a finger on all of it. Under God's judgment, they were actually pronounced blind. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Those who are perishing, as Paul says, don't hear the gospel. They don't hear it, don't want to hear it, don't want any part of it. They're like those at the Tower of Babel. They say, we want to build our own city. We want to have our own institutions. We want to have our own method of worship and place of worship in the Tower. And we want to make a name for ourselves. That Paul says, in whose case the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves. We don't want to make a name for ourselves. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. When the Pharisees heard what Jesus was saying, verse 40 says that those of the Pharisees who were with him and heard these things and said to him, we are not blind too, are we? You're not talking about us, are we? Are you? <coughs> Jesus answers, and said to him, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say, We see, your sin remains. In Mark, it says in uh, chapter 12, verse 38, In his teaching, Jesus was saying, Beware of the scribes. And he usually included Pharisees in that, scribes and Pharisees. They kind of went together. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplace and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who devour widows' houses and for appearances' sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Jesus 
condemnation was usually directed at the religious leaders who had their liturgy down pat. This, this is how it is. You have to conform uh, to our teaching or else there's something wrong with you. In answer to this situation, Jesus, the Pharisees saying, well, we're not blind too, are we? Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. Now remember, he's answering the Pharisees. This is not just a general teaching to everybody. The door into the fold of the sheep. Many people have understood this to mean heaven. The door to heaven, the sheepfold. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. The sheepfold in this particular case was the Jewish religion. And the scribes and Pharisees were supposed to be the shepherds of the sheepfold. Jesus is pointing out their failure. The one who does not enter by the door of the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. And the only difference between a thief and a robber is a thief just steals, a robber uses violence or the threat of violence in his theft. He who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. What is he talking about? Well, Jesus came through the door. He came into the world in the perfectly prescribed way. He came uh, as a result of the prophetic teachings of the prophets before he did everything that they uh, said that the Messiah should do. He says, to him, the doorkeeper, uh, some versions say porter, uh, the porter or the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The sheepfold, in this particular case, uh, is the Jewish religion. This was God's uh, revealed way that people were to approach him. And yet, those who should have been the shepherds were not. They were abusing the sheep. We have a picture of that, yeah, of a, of a sheepfold. Um, at night, the shepherds would gather near the sheepfold, and one by one, they would bring their their sheep into these uh, sheepfolds. And in some cases, there would be like a hallway, and there would be several sheepfolds off of the, the hallway. Some of them were pretty big and would hold quite a number of sheep of various flocks. Interesting thing about sheep, though, they know the voice of their own shepherd. We were. Uh, hunting up in Big Creek Canyon years ago. And uh, the hunting was not good because the canyon was full of sheep. Now, Big Creek Canyon is about six or seven miles long, and the canyon walls go up, I don't know, a thousand feet or more, and it was packed with sheep. And we climbed up thinking, well, maybe we'll go over the other side, and might, maybe there's some deer over there, because deer don't like sheep. Sheep have bells and they make noise, you know, they go bah all the time. <laughs> but at a certain point in the afternoon, uh, this uh, Indian on a horse with a dog just kind of slowly comes up the road. He wasn't in a big hurry. Uh, he gets up to a, about midway up the canyon and he just whistled one time, 
turned around and went out. And the sheep all just came down out of the mountains and followed him out. They knew his voice and they followed him. He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. A stranger coming in and says, hey, sheep, come on. They won't go. Jesus entered into the spiritual life of Jerusalem in the biblically prescribed manner. He answered everything that was written about the Messiah. He was born of a virgin. He was born in Bethlehem. Uh, he was born into the covenant people of Israel. Um, he was a true Israelite, born under the law. It's to him the porter or the gatekeeper opens. And we can look at the gatekeeper as the prophets. All of the prophets prophesied of the Messiah. Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies and culminating with the teaching of John the Baptist. John the Baptist introduces Jesus to the people of Israel. This is your Messiah. He comes into the sheepfold. He is the one who is uh, the rightful shepherd. And he calls his sheep. And his sheep responds. John says when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. The true sheep know who their master is. But it says that this figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. They were obtuse. He was clearly explaining to them who he was, who he is, and how they should respond. They were spiritually blind. They were blinded by their religion. Do you ever notice that? Religion is often, often the greatest impediment to faith. People who are stuck on practicing religion don't want to hear about faith. Then Jesus switches the metaphor. Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. In the previous statement, the door, Jesus was the one who entered the door to speak to his sheep, to call his sheep. But Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. There have been any number of false shepherds in Israel. In the same way, there are false shepherds among uh, the church. It's amazing that there are people who profess Christianity and yet don't believe in the basics of the faith. I... Uh, there was, years ago, there was a uh, uh, Episcopal bishop on a talk show. 
about this time of year. It was Easter. He was talking about Easter. He was going to give a talk on this talk show about Easter. And he's talking about bunnies and chickens and flowers, new life, celebration of new life. I said, i got to call this talk show. So I called in and said, hey, how about the resurrection of Christ? And he, this is what he said. He said, my faith is strong enough that I don't need a physical resurrection. <laughs> he said, my faith is, is stronger than that. that I, don't, I don't need to believe in a, a actual resurrection of Christ. And I didn't know enough at the time to retort that uh, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Your faith is worthless. Uh, I wish I had. I just kind of hung up. But I, I changed the, the tone of his talk when I did that. You know, and the rest of it, more you know, other people started calling in and, and uh, kind of rebuking this guy. But this is a guy who calls himself a Christian, uh, and, and he's a bishop in. The, a particular church, but he's not a believer. He's like the scribes and Pharisees. His particular religion has blinded him. Jesus is the door of the sheep. All who come before or in between or in place of are robbers and thieves. Jesus is the door. What did Jesus have to say about the uh, the religious leaders of his day? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? That was reserved for false teachers. Teachers who had set themselves up for monetary gain or respect among the populace or whatever their motivation was. But they were not shepherds of the sheep. Jesus again says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Earlier, when Jesus talked about the door, in a sense, he was a doorway uh, into a greater spirituality for the people of Israel that were cast out by their own teachers. This blind man who was excommunicated, he had been put outside the door. And Jesus was saying, don't worry about that door. I am the door. I am a new a new way to experience a spiritual life. You don't need to go into a synagogue or the temple. So, Mike, I, I, I often wonder about, you know, uh, the fact that we know in the um, final kingdom, you know, when, when we're in heaven with the Lord, will we go in and out? I mean... <laughs> uh, I don't think this is... He's talking about... Uh, going in and out of the final kingdom. I think he's talking about going in and out within the bounds of the, uh, of the spiritual life uh, on earth. He's talking about the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the temple or the church. Uh, but Jesus is the one that leads the sheep in and out. Now, it's a metaphor. Don't stretch it too far. But you've got to leave a little bit of room for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the blind man was given both uh, a, a spiritual and a physical salvation. 
Jesus cured his blindness, but he offered him uh, a different sort of spirituality. Think back to the woman at the well who said, well, we worship up here on Mount Gerizim, but you Jews say that the only place you can worship is on the Temple Mount. And Jesus said, the time is coming and now is that the Father wants people to worship in spirit and in truth. Uh, that's, that's a big topic, but the number one thing about that is it's not about a specific place. God is everywhere. God is spirit. We worship him in spirit and truth, and we don't need to go to a special place to do it. You don't even need to come here. We just get together here because we like each other, right? All right. But this, this was not a new issue in Jesus' time, the fact that there were false teachers. It goes back into Old Testament times. Ezekiel lived about 500 years earlier. Here's what God said to Ezekiel. He said, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, you who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. And those who are sickly you have not strengthened. The diseased you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost, but with force and with severity you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd, and they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep, so the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore, but I will deliver my flock from their mouth, so that you will not, they will not be food for them. Then God says through Ezekiel, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd, he's basically saying, I'm going to bypass this whole system. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among the, his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep, and I will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. And I will establish them for them a renowned planting place. Hmm, I think he's talking about a restored Israel here. I will establish them for them a renowned planting place, and they will not again be victims of famine in the land, and they will not endure the insults of the nations anymore. We're talking about the Messianic kingdom here. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. And as for you, my sheep, the sheep of my pastor, pasture, you are men, and I am your God, declares the Lord God. That is pretty harsh prophesied by Ezekiel. But Jesus is probably referring to this when he says, I am the good shepherd. Uh, just back in Ezekiel 34, 11, God says, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. We really can't make any other discernment that Jesus is referring to himself as God here. He is the Lord God. One commentator says it's a, 
a clear affirmation of his absolute deity. I am the Good Shepherd. That's a really huge statement. And he goes on, he says, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Wolves are often uh, symbols of false teachers, false prophets. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. Jesus repeats, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. None of these scribes or Pharisees were going to lay down their life for the sake of the sheep. And then he says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I have a whole bunch of sheep among the Gentiles. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. We don't like the idea of one flock, do we? We like... We like... Uh, uh, What's the word? We like a flock over here, a flock over here, a flock over here. I saw a, a meme online the other day. That somebody was praying, Lord, lead me to a church that is uh, large enough that I can, that nobody will notice if I'm not there. But small enough to where I can have good fellowship. We discriminate. You know, we, we live in a neighborhood here that across the way we have a Filipino church. None of them have ever come over here. Because I have gone over there, I'll, even though I know uh, I was in seminary with the pastor at the Filipino church. Uh, you know, we have Guatemalan churches, we have El Salvadoran churches, we have Nicaraguan churches, uh, we have Colombian churches. Uh, we self-segregate, don't we? But God says there's one, and I understand, there's language and culture and uh, issues uh, that they're dealing with. I, I used to feel that uh, the black churches and white, there, there should not be any such thing as black churches and white churches. But then I, I met a guy, a pastor from Chicago. He started telling us about the social issues that they were dealing with, you know, in the inner city of Chicago. I said, okay, you got me. Uh, you have problems that we don't, and I get it. But that's all one flock. We are all one, whether it's us or the Nicaraguan church across the way or the black church in Chicago. Uh, we're all one flock. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. Jesus was not forced to go to the cross. He could have said, no, I don't want to do it. He says, I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. And it says that a division occurred among the Jews, among the Jewish leaders, because of these words. And many were saying, he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Don't, don't listen to him because... He has, how did they know he had a demon or that he was insane? 
So whenever you don't have anything objective, you don't have an objective argument, always resort to uh, ridicule or name calling or ad hominem attacks. But others were saying these are not the sayings that one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? It tells us here that some of the Jewish leaders were actually believing in what Jesus had to say. We always tend to look at the, uh, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees as 100%, oh, except Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, right? Those were the good guys. But there were others. Uh, we hear little uh, bits about them in the book of Acts. There were a number of, of the Jewish leaders that did become believers. And there were Romans, Roman soldiers that became believers. Uh, it was a veritable flood. And these guys began to feel overwhelmed by this Jesus movement. Has anybody seen the movie, The Jesus Revolution? It was pretty good. Pretty good. Not, not great, but pretty good. Somebody said it should, it should have been the testimony of, uh, and now I can't remember the guy's name. Greg Glory. Greg Glory, yeah, should should be called the testimony of Greg Glory, and he had a major part in it, and but that was a good thing. Uh, see the movie if you can. In the book of Revelation, Jesus says, "Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door." I will come into him, and he will and will dine with him, and he with me. And he gave us a symbolic act to uh, to act this out. Jesus coming into us, having fellowship with us, dining with us. Just a little down payment on that. Uh, thing we call the wedding supper of the Lamb that we're going to experience in heaven. Uh, take this bread. Take this cup. Go ahead and pass out the elements.